Good, so let's move on to the next talk. Uh, now I invite Piers Tremlett and Dinesh Pomonova, two of the leading figures in the Zero Amp project, to give a talk together. I'm just setting it up here right now. I should say Simon is also a leading figure in the Zero Amp project. I'm, I'm just <laughs> moderating here. <laughs> uh, I'd like to say thank you to, to Marco Ceccarelli. That was a really interesting presentation and particularly pertinent to our technology, which is on the wrong side of the value of death. <laughs> right. Here you go. Thank you very much. So, uh, I think the important question about an end switch technology is, what's the point of it? Because there isn't a point to it, and there's no point in investing in it. So it enables electronics for impossible environments. That's our, our catchphrase and encapsulates nicely the capabilities of NEM switch technology. So we're very good in high radiation environments. We're very good in high temperature or indeed even in very fluctuating temperatures. Uh, we haven't tested, but we believe that we could go down to absolute zero. And we can go up to the point where you start getting creep in silicon. Additionally, we believe that we have very low power capabilities, and it's a combination of all of these capabilities that is our strength. We believe that we have applications in manufacturing, construction, industrial electronics, space, defense, nuclear, automotive, and oil fields that all have problems with this sort of environment. And many edge computing applications will, will require some combination of resilience if you have a sensor, then that sensor may be in a very harsh environment, if it's on a furnace, or in a nuclear power plant. Uh, so we'll be giving an example of a, an IoT platform uh, that could be uh, a platform for many applications within these environments. Later on, we'll have a talk about the battery passport that's specific to EV vehicles and perhaps for electric aircraft as well. And we'll be talking about rugged memory for harsh environments such as space drilling and industry. So uh, we're going to be covering the genesis of our project, NEM switch technology itself, and I'm covering the first five minutes, but Dinesh will take over from me and cover the technology aspects of it. Uh, then uh, Elliot will do a presentation about the, the design kit and then we'll return to talk about the development roadmap and our aspirations for the future and what we believe is the application space for NEMS technology with intelligence sensors and control systems with the token which is a demonstrator for the project being an example of this. And we'll also talk about harsh environment tracking and data collection which the battery passport and ruggedized memory are part of. So brief introduction to, to my uh, site. It's part of Microchip, which is a worldwide corporation. We're about 130 employees in a, a 30,000 square foot uh, facility, I should say meters really, shouldn't I, since it's a European project. Um, uh, we do uh, SMT, chip on board, wire bond, uh, which is exactly what uh, Marco was talking about. And we're very focused on solving very complex problems for our customers, which means that we tend to be in the high reliability environment. For example, we make parts for pacemakers, which is a very uh, important part of our business. And we specialize in miniaturization. That, that's our sort of catchphrase. Bring us the problem and we'll shrink it down for you. And we wanted to expand into the harsh environment. Uh, so we were looking at control systems where we identified an advantage where the control system, it's normally remote from wherever the hot sensor and actuator is, but if we can move it right to where the sensor and actuator is, we get lots of benefits such as uh, EMC resistance, response times, bandwidth, calibration control, and we'll, we'll give you examples of that later. But the high temperature memory side of things was missing. We didn't have boot memory, we didn't have calibration memory, uh, and so we went to look for Dinesh. Bristol University were doing uh, research into men's relays, 
and that offered a, a capability for us. It was just what we're looking for. We then got together in a project called uh, Nemica, and this was for a control system for a, a jet engine. It had to withstand 175 degrees C on the actual uh, fuel flow valve actuator. And you can see on the left-hand corner, one of our circuits that sat on an existing, it had fit into the existing space that there was on the cap between that and the torque, torque motor. We then went on to form this project, the Zeram project. Uh, it's an EU project with seven partners. It's been running for about two years now, and it's a four-year project, now four and a half after the pandemic. Uh, we started in January 2020, just as the pandemic was taking off. And uh, essentially, it's to develop mechanical transistors rather than uh, uh, normal electronic type FET transistors. So I'll now hand over to Dinesh, who's the... Uh, Thank you, Piers. So I'll be um, talking about the, the technology itself. So first up, we have the devices, and we have two flavors of it. We have what we call volatile switches that turn off uh, when actuation is removed. So you take off the actuation voltage, and then the, so the, the relay just turns off. Uh, and then we have two, two versions of this. We uh, have three terminal switches and four terminal switches. And I'll explain you know, where each are used in, in the coming few slides, so they're useful in different scenarios. And then we have um, non-volatile switches that we uh, uh, use in lieu of memory. So when you take the, uh, when you turn the power off, they stay switch uh, and retain the state, so that's our uh, on-chip memory. And a unique aspect, one unique aspect of what we're doing here, is that you can actually place the logic switches, which is the volatile switches, adjacent to the non-volatile memory, which is not something that you can typically do in any other competing process, CMOS. Uh, and this gives us significant advantage from a sort of computer architecture point of view, and I'll touch uh, briefly on that. So these devices were developed uh, at Bristol, and they sort of underpin the technology uh, of the Zero Amp. Uh, we do densely integrated chips by starting with a, a standard boundary offering wafer. So we use the XI10 process from XFAB and we do a, a wafer with a multi layer interconnect stack. Uh, we don't ask them to do anything else to it, we just take it as they would offer it to a standard uh, uh, commercial customer. And then at Bristol, so actually KTH do some bonding to it, some processing to it, and then send it to Bristol where we structure the switches. Um, and then uh, we send it over to AMO who do the all important contact solution, which is key to maintaining the reliability of these switches. And then KTH do a final uh, release edge to actually free the devices so that they, they can move about freely and that defines the fully integrated on-chip uh, NEMS circuits. Yeah, and this is a process that uh, we uh, feel is a, is a big strength of our approach because it allows a lot of flexibility, choices, substrates. And most importantly of all, it helps us leverage existing semiconductor foundry technology. We, you know, whatever great uh, device or circuit you have, it's just a novelty toy if you cannot actually fit it into existing semiconductor uh, infrastructure. You know, no, you can't upend a foundry process and ask them to develop an entire new fab, do one, one single device. So this is something that uh, is a strength uh, of our approach. Then KTH do some uh, on-chip uh, leading uh, wafer level packaging. Uh, microchip do some ruggedized packaging. And then we have a uh, another partner, CSEM in uh, Switzerland, who do most of the testing. So in any development process, it's a, it's a robust uh, methodology to separate the testing out from the development as much as possible. And, and that's what we've adopted. Uh, and that's sort of a nutshell of how the, the project runs, Zero Amp runs. So uh, here's an example 
of one of our most fundamental basic switches. So we have what we call a three terminal relay. And the three terminals are, we have the gate, which is where you apply the controlling voltage. You have a wheel, which is the moving part. Uh, and when you apply a potential difference between the gate and the beam, there's an electrostatic force across, you know, because of the field, electric field across the air gap, pulls the beam in, tip lands on a third electrode of the brain, named with an analogy transistors, and that's the on state. And that's what you um, see, see, oops, sorry. Um, Which is the, the page inside here. Oops, sorry, sorry, sorry. Go the other way. Okay, sorry. Um, okay, let's go back one more and then try again. So I think that'll trigger the video. So the voltage at which it pulls in uh, is called the pull-in voltage. And then when you reduce uh, this voltage, uh, beyond the, below the voltage that we should actually pull it in, it pulls out and that's the off-state. And the reason we have this hysteresis is because there's inevitably stiction or surface adhesion at the contact. And you need to bring the voltage, the electrostatic force a little bit below the one required to pull it in. Eventually the spring force takes out and the whole thing pulls out and that's the off-state. And here we have, uh, you know, a couple of large scale prototypes that we could actually feel big enough to feel that illustrate this. The advantages are air gap in the off state, except for some you know, very small tunneling in a very small regime of switching, zero off state leakage. Abrupt switching pulls out. So you, you escape from what people call the well, Boltzmann's tyranny for CMOS, because fundamentally you have this slope that you cannot escape uh, when you work with CMOS that always leads to leakage and energy loss. We don't have that because you don't have a channel and uh, all the other things that cause transistors to, to work. Uh, inherently high temperature and radiation resistant. Um, so we have a, a four terminal relay, uh, which gives you huge advantages with respect to uh, a few things which I'll explain in, in a second. But the way we build it is we have this dual beam architecture and we have a, uh, uh, an insulating plug between the two beams. So the point of this is that we can actually isolate or decouple the control voltage from the data voltage. So you apply a voltage now between the body and the gate, and the body voltage has absolutely nothing to do with the source voltage. So therefore, you have this complete decoupling between the two voltages, and that allows us to do quite a few important things. One is you can apply a bias to the body uh, and pull it in at a much smaller voltage than you would if you couldn't do that. And people always ask about high switching voltage for relays. Well, here's a way of reducing the switching voltage. And the swing is what, so anybody who's worked with CMOS, or it's a swing that's important for dynamic energy, half CV squared or CV squared. We can reduce it to, you know, one volt, for example, and that has a huge impact both on the switching voltage but also on the power and energy. Uh, it has, other people have tried this, but what's unique about this approach is it's a single contact. The contact is always the Achilles heel of these contact switches. Having one instead of two or three, which other people have, very useful. Simple fabrication process because it's in plane and we have a, a common, so at the heart of all this, our approach is manufacturability compatibility with EDA platforms. Marco was talking about EDA platforms and access to it. So we leverage all that. And having a common geometrical framework with the 3T relay allows us to be, you know, our design and layout is very modular. Just a quick example of what I mentioned about body biasing. So if you don't put a, a, a bias, you put it in, for example, the large prototype that pulls in at 36 volts, pulls out at 28, had that um, uh, hysteresis that I mentioned earlier, but the point is you can apply a bias, which is this uh, electrode node here, and you can just linearly bring down the switching voltage, which gives us a, a, a huge advantage. Here's uh, um, 
one to two multiplexer that we've built using these 40 relays. So the way it should work is we have a select signal and depending on whether it's zero or one, it needs routed to either out zero or out one. And the way we've tested this is we've grounded, so we've sort of, if you like, shown you one half of the truth table, there'll be eight rows to the truth table. I've just, for clarity, I've shown you four. If you ground the select signal, depending on whether the gates are one or zero, you'll route input to out zero or out one. And the point of this is, you know, of all the technical stuff apart, if you did this with a three terminal relay, you'd need 10 transistors. That's the only way, the minimum number of transistors, you, oh, sorry, I uh, beg your pardon, relays that you'd need to do this. So we have a huge advantage uh, by having 40 relays. The third type of device of our technology is this seven terminal relay, and this is our non-volatile switch. So you can, uh, it's a unique architecture, circular. Uh, I don't know if you remember in the video, but as you saw the wheel bending, you see that sort of non-uniform air gap, uh, so that it's closer at the tip and further away from the hinge because of the way it's a straight line bending, you know, you're always going to have an angle. This is a circular relay that actually uh, eliminates all that. So that means we, for the first time, we produced a relay that actually gets rid of mechanical hysteresis. And we can design it so that the surface adhesion force at the contacts actually holds it in. So you switch it, turn it off, turn all the power off, and it just retains its state. Uh, and you know, we tested it for six months, uh, up to this point, 200 degrees centigrade, uh, and it seems uh, to retain its state perfectly. Uh, and we are continuing uh, some of these experiments and we're building memory based on this. Uh, but we can also switch it electrically. So you can, so you can think about it, it rotates left clockwise or anti-clockwise. One side is uh, digital one, the other side is digital zero. You can switch it and keep it switched pretty much forever. Uh, no energy required. Um, harsh, you know, no leakage. There's no charge to leakage, uh, to, to leak. And there is, uh, you know, high radiation resistance just because of the nature of the, of the device. So those three are the three devices that we use. Another big problem is the fact that we have a lot of switching, uh, so, you know, landing, um, of the, of the contact, uh, surfaces and this causes huge degradation a fundamental problem that uh, nobody really had solved so we've been working on a couple projects with this uh, I, I one project we worked on was with IBM who trialed um, uh, amorphous carbon as a coating which was very successful but it was quite unstable so we've developed a, a crystalline form of carbon working along with Caliber Mine at Southampton University uh, called, we call it nanocrystal graphite uh, and that just transforms the reliability so you can just, you know, you don't have to have so typically the NEMS, NEMS relays to keep in nitrogen ambient or you know, all kinds of fussy switching just put it in a package, take it out six months later switch it and it works, it's, it's incredibly stable um, and uh, that's the key to the lifetime uh, that we hope to, you know, reach um, in terms of number of hot cycles of these relays. Uh, integration, uh, we have, uh, uh, you know, as I said, we start with the uh, XFAB uh, wafer from the X19 process. I have to say this process is slightly different from the exact one we use in the project just because we haven't patented it or published it up to this point, but it's, it's very similar. So we, uh, the, the basic idea is you start with the interconnect wafer, and the reason we do that is foundries do this very, very well. Uh, so you, there's no 100% yield pretty much, uh, you know, you don't, it would take us tens of years to develop this level of capability uh, in an academic lab. So we just use that capability bond another wafer to it, 
um, thin down one side or the other and then just fabricate devices um, on one of the wafers and then we do our contact deposition, do the release and hey presto, we have a, a fully integrated multi-layer interconnect stack, devices on top, which would be impossible to do uh, if you had a sort of a monolithic process from ground up, not impossible, but very difficult to do. Um, so that's uh, a key part of our approach. Uh, I'm going to touch on two prototypes very briefly. So we are developing a non-volatile memory uh, with everything being made of relays. So that's no point having the storage element in a relay and then the addressing in CMOS because then it wouldn't withstand the, the high temperature capability. So uh, we have uh, control circuits, uh, word line drivers and so on also built from relays. And this is just an example of a, uh, a three by three tile memory just for the sake ease of uh, showing it. Uh, and the, the, the two diagrams on the right hand side, for those of you who work with Cadence, uh, uh, you might recognize it, but this is a, one of the core tools that all IC designers use all over the world um, for physical design, especially. We, so we have uh, implemented our relays on top of the interconnect uh, stack from the XI10 process, and that's what you see with the VRs and, uh, and all that and two, two circuits there. Um, FPGAs, uh, so eventually we want to build uh, an FPGA. For those of you who know what that is, is the key point of an FPGA is you can program not just the logic, but also the interconnect. So you can configure it to prototype uh, any accelerator or whatever it is. It's a, in a much quicker turnaround time than you can do an ASIC. And typically FPGAs, you have, uh, I could say you have broadly two approaches. Xilinx Intel use SRAM based approaches, uh, which is the most common. Uh, and the key thing is when you want to program the interconnect, you need to have this switchable matrix. And each node uh, is made up of six pass transistors here. The state of that pass transistor has to be stored in a six RAM, six cell SRAM. Um, and then that's also volatile. Turn the power off, you lose the state. Um, and uh, so that's uh, what you'd see in Xilinx Intel uh, devices. Microchip have a flash-based approach. Um, they are instead of, uh, so the, you have the you know, flash cell storing the state of, this, uh, of each of these switches uh, on the chip itself. Uh, microchip also have some one-time programmable, that's what I call OTP there that they produce for the for military grade, um, which uh, withstands a uh, higher temperature. Uh, and so along this line, we are now proposing this NEM-based FPGA. And there's a big point to this because we have, I mentioned this at the outset, because we have non-volatile capability alongside logic on the same chip, you can just implement these switches in a much more efficient way. Um, and there I know, I can show you circuits and so on later if you're interested, but the headline figure is compared to SRAM, you know, Xilinx Intel technology, for a single node, programmable node, we save on 38 devices. We don't need the SRAM, we don't need to store the state off chip if you want non-volatile capability. And so you might think that the devices are large, so I've shown you some large prototypes that we're trying to be real miniaturize, but you have to compare it not at the device level, but at the cell level. So instead of something that consumes 44 uh, transistors, you'll have um, six relays. Uh, so I think so that, that's the, so we have this architecture within this um, FPGA that leverages those strengths. Finally, before I hand over to Elliot, so none of this would work if we didn't have a sophisticated design infrastructure. So the EDA, Electronic Design Automation um, tool set, uh, has been developed for ICs over thousands of uh, 
hundreds of thousands of person hours. And just like we do with the fabrication, we leverage all of that capability. So at the device level, we do the electromagnetic, um, um, so electrostatic uh, uh, development using ANSI, so finite element modeling. And then we feed, we have some reduced order models that we feed into circuit simulators that allows us to do lots of, you know, we, the finite element simulation you can do one device at a time simulated. With, you can do thousands, hundreds of thousands uh, at circuit level. So that's, uh, so we have this sort of connection between the two where the model feeds into the circuit level. We use for the FPGA microarchitecture development, we use a freeware tool called VTR. Cadence again for layout, and then VTR is used to map any, you know, you, you can't present somebody with an FPGA and tell them you have to learn how to program it from scratch. So we use exactly the same technique. You can have RTL, hardware description language, input, programming. We'll be able to provide a tool set that will synthesize it and map it to the FPGA. I'll hand over to Elliot, who will demonstrate how that works, uh, some aspects of it. Yeah, just to hammer home how easy it should be to use our technology. I'm going to try and show a little bit of the workflow and how you can go from just an idea of what you want from the device all the way through to simulating it, verifying that that individual device works, uh, up to the circuit level simulations that Dimitri was just mentioning here. So we have this initial MATLAB application, at which point you've probably seen from how the devices look. There's a lot that you can fine tune in order to get exactly the characteristics that you want. So this has all been bundled together for the 3T, the 4T, and the 7T into this single application where we can generate the geometry, export that onto a GPS, and fine tune any of the parameters that we have here. So just a quick example would be changing the length of the gate. And I'll just enable that to instantly update there. So you can see that the gate length has just been shrunk. We can do that a bit more. Change the height as well. And just easily go through whatever ideas you have in terms of the geometry. This also works for the seven terminal device. Across here, of which we can add in features like edge holes for the manufacturability side of things. And this even extends onto, as Janet mentioned, taking it onto simulating the devices. So this incorporates an ANSYS exporting a file that ANSYS can then read and run as a script. So we can run all sorts of static simulations, transient simulations, harmonic analysis, and I think we might possibly want there. Of which, unfortunately, it will take a little bit too long to go through and run these hour-long simulations. So I've got some example images that we have here of a transient simulation where on the top left we have the applied voltage and that's held at 30 volts for a couple of thousand microseconds there and it's finally ramped up. And you can see the displacement of the tip on the top right there. So it, the device is actually oscillating before we finally pull it in and it snaps down. Which we can zoom in on that. And we can see a static analysis here where the displacement of the tip comes down and we ramp that up with the blue curve there. You can see that. And then as we reduce the voltage again, we have a bit of a hysteresis that's visible before the green coping snaps back up. So you can fine tune that in MATLAB, run it with a single button, and you'll get these kind of graphs out at the end. So you can determine that the device will satisfy your needs. Another script then allows us to create this reduced order model that we can import into Cadence the circuit design tool that we've been using so far. And this integrates in with the XFAB PDK. So we deliver this as a single zip file. You go, you install it as an add-on. 
So one command you run after downloading the file, and then you're introduced to an extra zero amp library where we have primitives, we have some basic devices that you can run through, and I've got a We've got an example looking towards the FPGA, one of our, our goals, a basic logic element that we have. So on the left hand side, you can see the schematic and on the right, a layout using both the NEM technology and the XFAB. I wanted to see XFAB technology there. So you can go through, you can run all of your checks, whether that be DRC, LVS, and then run some simulations. We go past here, which this is for a single uh, three terminal device where you can see the top curve is the voltage across the beam, the red curve is across the gate, and when those differ by the potential, potential voltage required for pull in, then the device will snap down, which you can see on this bottom orange curve. That is the position of physical position of the device itself. So it's starting up until two microseconds there. It's in a, a stable position, at which point after the potential is applied, we have different voltages there. It snaps down and makes contact there, allowing a connected path to appear there. And then once we release that, you can see the device actually oscillating as we go. So we're doing quite a detailed simulation. And that can then go on to design your um, fully fleshed circuits, send that off to tape out, and then go on to the fabrication side of things. That was all that I wanted to show there. So I can't to... Thanks very much, Elliot. So, so that shows that we've got a very comprehensive uh, design kit for putting this all together that uh, enables people to. Bring it together. Do we need to swap back to the other question? Sorry? F5. Just do it like this. Okay. I think. Oh, good. Okay. This conference will now be recorded. Thank you very much. Uh, so first of all, I'll talk about the packaging, and then I'll talk about our aspirations to the roadmap, and then come back to the, uh, the commercial applications. <clears throat> so a lot of this is drawn from the Nemica project, and on the left-hand side, you can see the uh, native circuit we're putting around this uh, torque valve that control the fuel flow in the jet engine. Uh, the, the, the next two images, the one on the bottom left of the package and the one in the middle at the top, were that was a package that was run for 10,000 hours at 250 degrees C. So we're talking about serious reliability at serious temperatures. Um, with Zeran, however, we're trying to move even further beyond that up to temperatures around about, we're, we're aiming for about 340 degrees C. And for that, we're going to have to move to ceramic packaging that we have um, played with in the past. We also have a, a wafer scale uh, packaging facility by Simon at KTH, and that's enabled us to provide a hermetic atmosphere around our relays, which we believe will uh, increase the life of the relay still further. And it can either be a vacuum or it can be an inert gas. Um, and we've already successfully demonstrated this. You can see uh, an SEM image up in the top right-hand corner, and on the bottom right-hand corner, you can see a whole wafer that's been uh, processed with various different size loads. So our prototyping strategy to manage the yield issues that we'll have with devices is uh, to use system in a package to create a larger device once we've got that one established, then we'll fab that as a chip, and then we'll put that chip onto a system in package, and iteratively we'll build up the, the yield. So in the far left-hand far left corner, you can see an example of one of our 
one bit memory blocks, which is a cloudable memory block. And the image in the right hand side, you can see our system in a package. We can take that one bit memory block, put nine of them down on our system in a package, test that as a nine bit memory, prove that is okay, and then we can put that into a new chip and fab that, and then return that back to the system in the package. But our long term goal is to go for a complex system in a package where we have an FPGA, we have memory, we have sensors, and we have wireless power and data transmission on a, initially a system in a package, maybe on a silicon chip or some complex PCB. And then hopefully one day we can move this to a system on a chip with a MEMS style um, foundry and thereby have a very sophisticated but low cost chip enabling us to have high volume manufacturing. So we have to leverage these three characteristics of known devices. The first is its ability to withstand high radiation. So we're talking about cosmic radiation with uh, space applications. And we're talking about high radiation environments with gamma rays or heavy ions and accelerators, nuclear reactors, and even uh, hospital environments for treatment of uh, patients. We can also withstand high temperatures, but also high levels of temperature fluctuation. Um, so in that case, we can think about going in and out of manufacturing ovens, and we can also operate extremely low power. That's relevant to areas that are difficult to access or expensive to access, or where weight is at a premium or space is at a premium. And in particular, which relates to the high temperature, there's a zone at about 150 degrees C to 340 degrees C, roughly, where batteries are extremely difficult to get hold of. So you have poor power sources. And um, when we look at this, the, the important thing about this Venn diagram is our products are likely to be where these fields overlap. So the ideal zone is going to be in the middle here, which tends to be things like space where you've got radiation, you've got temperature fluctuation, you've got a shortage of power, um, and uh, in the industrial IoT field, which is in this same year, you've got low power because you've got batteries and you've got high temperature. So this Venn diagram guides us towards the areas where there will be particularly strong applications, and some of the customers here represent those uh, overlapping zones. So uh, you think when you're trying to monitor uh, complex systems, do you have to have a very complex type computer to be able to do that? But really what we're after is a simple system that tells us whether we've got an okay state or we're beginning to get into a problem area or we really need to take quick action. And by having relatively simple systems, you can have a system that, that gives you this kind of traffic light uh, alert status. And we believe that our NEMS devices, sitting in uh, as fairly simple devices, can give you uh, a response almost immediately from a sensor in a very harsh environment. So for example, we may have a, this torque control motor, we're trying to do health monitoring on it. There's a bandwidth problem. What you need is a simple signal like this, where the, uh, the jet engine manufacturer can keep it in the air for as long as possible. For us, trying to control our manufacturing system, we'll talk about the token later, and we'll talk about this. I'll talk about this in a bit. Um, we want simple IoT systems like this that we can sell to customers, give them valuable information without too much uh, bandwidth uh, being stolen from the cloud. So this is our demonstrator within the project. It, it measures the reflow profile of components being sold to an SMD board. And the problem is that changes all the time depending on the loading in the oven, as uh, some people here will know. Uh, the problem um, with this is that you have to have a heavy case around it and insulation when you load that into the system, it affects the profile, so you can't have other work going through it. 
it comes out really hot, so you can't have an in-process monitoring. By using NANS devices, we'll be able to have something that's light, equivalent to the works going through, and we can just put a token in, hence the name token, to be able to, uh, as all the work's going through, which would be great for things like process monitoring, SPC, but we have even bigger visions for that. Um, oh, right. We think this is going to be a, a platform for not just measuring temperature, Within our, our process in microchip, we want to be able to monitor the device right from when we kit, we put everything together, when it goes through wash, when it goes through um, epoxy curing, we'll get real data from that device. And that's our vision for this. We've also been doing work on the previous project in Nemeca on a fuel flow valve, which was being controlled by the failure, which is sits on the cool part of the engine here, and there's always problems with trying to get data down through the wiring that uh, goes to the hot section, um, because there's a limited amount, there's a limited weight of wiring you can have. By moving the control system down onto the device here, we then had greater computing capability, then we could fit more sensors, then we could detect when the device was going wrong more readily and provide better control, and since jet engine manufacturers rent their engine in by hours in the air, and they make the money from that, they can then say, well, we can keep that engine going for longer because that fuel flow valve is still fine, and we'll only bring it down when it shows signs of going wrong, as well as providing more accurate control of the fuel flow as well. We're, on, we're talking about hysteresis, there's better control of uh, hysteresis and things like that. But the problem with that system was that we needed boot memory to be able to boot up the con control system on it, um, and that was the role of the MEMS device uh, for that particular application. But going forward, we might be able to turn it totally into a MEMS device. And then the final application that we're investigating is the battery passport. And there are four stages to a battery's life. When you make it, and these days with conflict minerals, people are interested in the provenance of, of those batteries. Um, when you're using it, you want to know how it's performing, the charge speed, the life, the total energy record. And as the uh, battery is charged and discharged, then the life of that starts declining. And eventually that has to be moved out of the car because the uh, battery doesn't last for long enough, but it still has a, a useful life for wind energy and solar cell energy, which is intermittent, dump the charge into these batteries that still have a charge capability left to be able to provide energy, let's say at night when there's no wind. And then finally, there's disposal and recycling. And this battery passport will give accountability for the battery and its you know, creation and uh, disposal. It'll provide a benchmarking to, to show that it's really uh, working as it should do. And it helps validate, validate the uh, Paris Climate Agreement. For example, um, people, uh, governments might want at a, what we call an MOT here, but a, a safety check that that data is downloaded and collated by the government to know how all EVs are being um, charged. Um, I also wonder, since we're trying to operate our token through our manufacturing process, whether for a battery manufacturer it won't help them while they're actually assembling the battery to be able to have um, you know, a, a record of that batch being made, where it is, how it was made, what the conditions were while it was being made. And there's a later presentation by Andrew Moore on this. So, I start off with what's the point of NEM switch technology? It enables electronics for impossible environments. Uh, memory and logic, and Dinesh said this can be brought together as well on the same chip, the same process. It can work in space, accelerators, industrial ovens, processing data from sensors in harsh environments like industrial ovens to a, um, uh, things like Industry 4.0 and uh, IIoT, 
controlling systems more effectively by having the control right there, the example of the jet engine, and tracking and recording data forever. The National 7T relay, where the relay is held permanently mechanically by subatomic forces. There's no charge that can leak away. It's data forever. So, hence the battery passport. And that concludes my presentation. So, thank you very much, everybody. Um, I think there's coffee now, is that right? Yes, that right? now there's a coffee break. Uh, um, I think if there are some questions, we can yes, take now. I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> and also, I didn't have a question. <laughs> Also Sorry, does anyone have any questions? Also for people online, don't forget to write your questions in the chat if there are any. I, I have two. Yes. And um, when you said absolute zero at the other temperature extreme, did you mean minus 273 degrees? I, I did. I have to qualify that we haven't done the tests on it. That's our expectation. We do have it in the project to be able to not necessarily get to absolute zero, but to get low temperatures. Sure. And the second question is, what's the typical switching time for the relays? And how does that translate to rewrite times in the memory? So, um, we, it's of the range of about half a microsecond to a microsecond for the mechanical delay. But uh, this has to be compared not with an individual um, transistor latency, but with the entire sales of example of flash need to uh, erase uh, an entire block which can take a few milliseconds. Mm -hmm. So it's it's not meant to replace desktop computing or anything like that, but it, it will uh, for the types of applications that we can visit, bursty data types, uh, like sort of wake up and some activity to go back to sleep. I think it's uh, perfect. Temperature, but you said you had a polymer bar plug on one of the slides. Will that take high temperature? Yeah, so this is just one of the prototypes. We have uh, different uh, um, materials, uh, again, some of which we haven't published, but there's a different case solution there which had high temperature. Uh, the other one was uh, one of the slides uh, that your colleagues showed. Um, it was clearly resonating. You could see the big movement. At about 500 kilohertz. That was, I think, for the small switch. What sort of resonant frequency do you have on the large switches, the, the, the rotating ones? Uh, what type of resonant frequency we have? We have, I think, a few uh, uh, tens of megahertz, uh, tens of megahertz, um, and uh, uh, typical disturbance frequencies are usually in the range of kilohertz. Uh, or well, we get it after a lot longer than that. that. <laughs> so we are actually, that's part of the testing that we have, a, that we are engaging with CSEM, so we produce some uh, PCB prototypes where they are mounting some special kit that has a vibrating in every which way to, where there's a question that everybody asks. Yes, so yes. We are trying to find the answer, but I mean, my gut feeling is it's not a problem. Just because of the very uh, low mass um, and the way in which uh, you can set off the resonance. Okay. Do you do you seal it? Do you seal it in uh, oxygen or in vacuum? Not for well. Eventually, we plan to, uh, but uh, for these tests, we don't. Okay. So you're showing sealing yeah. an hermetic technique in the gold bond. Would that be? So we've we've shown the technique. Yeah. Uh, Simon's demonstrated it in, in, and you saw the, the wave slides there. Mm -hmm. We haven't yet brought those two things together to demonstrate. I think that's right. We have not tested these switches in the vacuum packages oh. yet. Okay. That's, that's well, great. You may not want to because resonant frequency cues will get much higher if you in vacuum. Yeah, but there are other advantages actually by oper operating them in vacuum, which will for our application, definitely be more important than, than a slight disadvantage in the resonant frequency. Yeah. And we also have the capability to fill with nitrogen as well. So Yeah, we can also fill the cavities with nitrogen yeah. to have to have a, a completely inert atmosphere, but it doesn't have to be vacuum. We, we can choose 
what to package it in. Yeah, yeah. Well, that, that yeah. 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 yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Yes. yeah. Yeah. Okay. Any? Yeah. Um, first of all, very impressive. You know, really enjoyed that. Um, I have two very short questions. The first one is since mechanical relays, which do you observe bounds like you do with a mechanical switch or a mechanical relay? And if so, um, what is the pattern for the bounds? So, yeah, come to me. Uh, yes, we do. Uh, so, it, it, the, the, you know, you can get all kinds of uh, different kinds of uh, bouncing, so you can uh, oscillate uh, depending on the shape of the vehicle with which you drive the gate. It can actually uh, bounce on the contact and bounce back up. Uh, but these are relatively minor compared to the main problem we have, which is the contact degrades. So in the first instance, we would resolve this by allowing enough time for it to settle. Um, but there are also all kinds of weird, clever things you can do by uh, driving it in a particular shape so you can actually take advantage of the downward point of the cycle to actually reduce the mechanical frequency. So once it you know, releases and it's oscillating, if you're driving in a great pattern, but these are sort of quite advanced techniques that we haven't really spent a lot of time on. Yeah, yeah, another question, and the same one if I may. This is a, a mechanical system, and I was very intrigued by the, uh, the metastable uh, circular uh, pattern. So, is this intrinsically vibration sensitive? So, is the reliability of the contacts um, dependent on uh, external vibrations to the system? For example, if you have it in a, in a jet engine where vibrations are extreme. Again, great question. So the test that we have tried so far, not seeing any issue with vibration. There's a little bit, um, uh, additional thing that we didn't quite mention. If you want to, uh, you could actually uh, pass a current through the contact and completely build it, so it never moves again. There's one type of programmer. But for multi-type programmer memories, we haven't really uh, seen any uh, you know, quite vibration related failure mode, but at the same time, I'm quite cautious of playing with something without testing it today, so we are currently testing it. Um, I haven't seen anything that up to this point what is being really I, I think it's a kind of, so, so many people, I think Simon was mentioning the other day that many people sort of are not that worried about vibration because we don't really see. Uh, this is an issue most of the time. The about mechanical it. aspects of MEMS devices tend to be very stable. And in this particular switch, it's actually the electrostatic forces that are dominating. We're, we're not actually using the spring force or the stiffness. We're using the electrostatic forces and the adhesion at the tip as the robust uh, you know, forces to keep the device shut and to move it. Do you know the adhesion force? Um, I, I can't remember the units. Oh, you put, you put it out in advance, so you must have yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, the, so uh, would answers tell you whether the, the presence has been mm -hmm. likely to pull that up, pull that up that's yes. pull that off? Yes, the, the, analysis been done? The, the analysis has been okay. done and we found it to be negligible. Um, but at the same time, you know, the proof of the pudding is in the okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. it. <laughs> and see and get with it right now. Test it and we'll be modeling in that way. Yeah. I'm going to need ultrasonic shaker tables, not just the usual shaker to kind of get that to you. That's not the idea. Yeah. 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 Mm. Okay, no questions online? Well, I'm sure we can continue questions yeah. during the coffee break. Some great questions. Uh, I would say we, yeah. we take it. 20 minutes break, we're slightly behind schedule, so let's start the next talk at 5 past 11 UK time. Uh, for those here in the room, we actually have a couple of prototypes here where you can see those integrated and bonded chips on a, on a PCB. If you're interested, you can come and have a look. Otherwise, there is coffee. It's out, it's over there. Okay. Through that door, just outside there.